We're at the end. We've done it, guys. We have, we've gotten through the, no, we've gotten through Colossians, one of the shorter books of the Bible. <laughs> but uh, this has been, this has been, an, for me, a, a, a challenging and encouraging journey through this letter where Paul is looking to highlight the gospel. And he is seeking to highlight the, the reality of the gospel, the truth of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and hit those implications for our lives. And he's gone from telling us about what the gospel is and, and how great Jesus himself is to talking about how that applies to our lives in general terms and then in specific terms in our roles and responsibilities. And he's come to the end where he's going to give some of his final greetings. Now, normally we would stand and, and all of us would read together. There are a lot of names in here, and so I just don't want to subject you guys to that. But we are going to stand together as I read Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 through 18. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and a fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother who is, with you, who is one of you, they will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in, in the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. Luke the, the, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And see to it that you read the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you've received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. This is the word of the Lord to us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for Paul. We thank you for the ministry that you accomplished through his life, through his letters. And God, I, I thank you for the example that he sets for us of God-oriented relationships. Lord, I recognize and, I, and, and we come to you knowing that you have called us to be a people. And at the same time, you've brought together a diversity of people from different backgrounds, different life circumstances, different settings, with different experiences. And yet you call us to evidence our discipleship by our love for one another. Lord, we, we see that this is a high calling, a challenging calling, sometimes a painful calling, but one that you're not unfamiliar with. And Lord, I pray that you would impress upon us uh, not just the necessity of pursuing others out of a, a faithfulness to you, God, but, but the benefit and the joy of it. God, I pray that you would bring life and healing and restoration to relationships, that you'd bring encouragement by your spirit, and that you'd build us up by your word. Help us to live a life that, that honors you uh, and that keeps Jesus, keeps you before us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You guys can be seated. So in this final section, Paul gives us a list of individuals who have worked with him in ministry, uh, as well as those who are working at or near Colossae uh, in, in Christian ministry. These, these are individuals who are participating in the work of God, and we're going to look at these individuals, and, and this is going to be a little bit different than how I normally approach uh, the text, but we're going to look at the people, we're going to talk a little bit about each, each one, and then we're going to 
uh, I'm going to make some observations for our own lives. Okay, so we have really three groups of people, or three sections: the the couriers, the the co-laborers, and and the cl- concluding remarks that that Paul makes: the the couriers, the co-laborers, and then the concluding remarks. So in chapter in verse seven, he says, "Tychicus will tell you all about my activities." Now, this guy, uh, we'll call him Ty for short. He uh, he's the guy who's responsible to deliver the letter. And, and if you read in, in Acts um, and, and in at least one other, I think in Philemon, he's, he's mentioned this is a guy who, who, call, who has been walking with Paul for a while now. He came out of Asia, but he's been traveling a, as a companion and a fellow worker with Paul. And Paul is serving to uh, commend him to the Colossians. He, he calls him a beloved brother a faithful minister, and a fellow servant. And that, that phrase, fellow servant, kind of sets him at the same level as Paul. And he's basically saying, if you would accept and receive me, then certainly accept and receive my friend here, Ty. You can trust his word. He is trustworthy. Then Paul goes on and he says, you know, uh, I've sent him for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. He's encouraging them, hey, you don't know this guy, but you know me. Extend the same love and care and receive him as you would receive me and allow him to minister encouragement to you. And then he mentions this other guy, and with him Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. It's interesting that he mentions Onesimus because Onesimus is a runaway slave. And if you go to Philemon, one of the shorter books of the Bible, there's no, um, there's no chapter, it's just verses he mentions in verse 10, I appeal, he, so Paul is writing to this guy named Philemon, who we find out is, is the master of, of Onesimus. And if you were here a number of weeks back, we talked a little bit about masters and slaves and how the Bible does not condone slavery. And in the letter to Philemon, which was being carried with the letter to the Colossians, Paul says this to Philemon, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you, you and me. And, and there's some wordplay there because the name Onesimus, Onesimus means useful. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would be very glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on, behalf, on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but by your own accord. So there's, there's kind of a sense of him saying, I, I don't want to make you do this. I don't want to make you free him. And we'll just put it there. We'll leave it there. So he's got Ty and he's got Onesimus and he's sending these guys, they're his couriers and their purpose is to give an update for Paul's life, his ministry, and to encourage the Colossians. And, and that update is that Paul is in Rome. Uh, he is he has presented the gospel and he's been imprisoned because of it and they've taken him to Rome and and it's likely uh, three or four or maybe a few more years before his execution. But he is in Rome and they're going to let the Colossians know about what's going on. So he goes from talking about these these couriers to the co-laborers that he has and there's two groups, uh, two groups, (laughs) I don't know how that happened. Uh, There are two groups of co-laborers that he mentions. Those who are the Jewish co-laborers, they're they're Jewish by by, uh, ethnicity and nationality, and then the the Gentile co-laborers. So he mentions three individuals among the Jews. Uh, Aristarchus, my uh, my fellow prisoner who greets them, Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, and then Jesus, who's called Justice. Now, Aristarchus is a Thessalonian. He comes from Thessalonica. In the, same, in the same section of, of Acts that mentions Tychicus, our friend Ty, it also mentions Aristarchus, who comes from Thessalonica. Um, he's also accompanied Jesus on many of his, not Jesus, accompanied Paul on many of his journeys. And it says that he's a fellow prisoner, um, which likely means that he is a literal fellow prisoner. You know, th- there's, there's thought that maybe this is metaphorical and he's a prisoner to Christ, but more likely he's an actual, no, I'm, I'm, I'm actually in chains as well. So he's a prisoner with them. And then there's Mark. Now, you may, have, you may be familiar with the name Mark because there's a guy who wrote 
a book, and it's called Mark, right? It's the gospel according to Mark. And we believe that this guy was, received his testimony from Peter and that he was very likely the same Mark who was the cousin of Barnabas. Now, Mark accompanied Paul and Barnabas on Paul's first missionary journey. He, he then abandoned them in a place called Pamphyla. Mark abandoned Barnabas and Paul, and, and you can read about that in Acts 15. So Paul, being the guy that he is, he refused to take him back on the second journey. Barnabas was saying, come on, we can bring him back, we'll, we'll restore him, it's going to be great. And, and Paul was saying, no, he, he left us, he betrayed us, we're not doing this. And so actually, this, this amazing team of Barnabas, the encourager, the glue guy, he, he was the same guy who, who, took, saw, who took Paul in, and, and, and the Jewish, the, the Christians in Jerusalem were saying, we're not going to hang out with Saul, we know who this guy is. He's been persecuting the church. We're not, we're not dealing with that. And Barnabas says, no, 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 no. listen to him. God has, God has arrested his soul. His life has been changed. And Barnabas brought him in. The same Barnabas brought him in also brought in Mark and, and was trying to plead with Paul, hey, Paul, don't throw this guy away. Bring him in. And they part ways because of this, because Paul says no, he, he holds a hard line. Barnabas says yes. Barnabas ends up taking Mark with him to do ministry, and Paul ends up taking a guy named Silas. But here we see years later that Paul is reconciled and he's saying, you know what, Mark, is, he's with me. He greets you, he's with me. And in 2 Timothy, one of the last letters that Paul writes, we see that, that Paul has not only serve to co-labor with him, but, but he's asking Timothy, bring Mark because he's very valuable to me. Those people in your life who you find to be a challenge may end up being the very people that God sends into your life to be very valuable to you. These, and then he mentions a guy named Jesus called Justice, and there's not much to say about him except that he is a, his name is Jesus, and that's interesting, I suppose. Those were the Jewish Christians who were with him. Then he goes on and say, They've been a comfort to him and, and then mentions the, the non-Jewish, therefore the Gentile people. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature, fully assured in, the will of, in all the will of God. Epaphras is a pastor. He's a, he cares for this Colossian church. He's the same guy who Paul mentions in, in verses seven and eight of chapter one. Just as you learn talking about the gospel, just as you guys learned it from Epaphras, what? Our beloved fellow servant. He's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the spirit. This is a man who loves the Colossians. He doesn't just love the Colossians, Paul goes on and he says that he's been struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature. And for this, i sorry, I bear witness that he has worked hard for you and for those at Laodicea and in Hierapolis. This is why we didn't read it out loud together. <laughs> it's likely that Epaphras, who was converted in, in Ephesus by Paul, planted all three of these churches. The Colossian church, the, the church here in, in Laodicea, the, the one in Hierapolis, and he cares about them. He goes on and he mentions Luke, the beloved physician who greets you. This is the same Luke who's written the book of Luke, as well as the book of Acts. It's the same Luke who has been a, a traveling companion of Paul for, for years. And, and there's, there, we're not really sure why he, why he goes with them. It's possible that he goes as a personal physician to Paul. We're, we're not sure, but he has been a faithful servant with Paul. And then finally, Paul mentions Demas. Demas is a man who's been with Paul for a period of time. He's a co-worker currently with Paul, but we'll see in 2 Timothy that he's one who ends up abandoning Paul. And not just they part ways, but he, it says that he leaves Paul because of the love for the world, that he abandons, we think, the gospel, that he, he steps away from the faith and he falls away. After extending these greetings with these people, he makes, Paul makes some concluding remarks, and we'll look at those briefly real quick. He says, Verse 15, give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and, in, and to Nympha and the church in her house. This likely there was a, a, a widow, a, a wealthy widow who, who had the church, hosted the church of um, one of the churches, I think, either in Laodicea or in Hierapolis. And it goes on. And when, when you read this letter, 
Then take it to the Laodiceans and let them read it. And, and we believe that Paul wrote a letter to the Laodiceans and he wanted uh, the Colossians to read that letter as well. We don't have the letter to the Laodiceans. There are a couple letters that we don't have of Paul's, but, but we trust that the ones that we have are the ones that God wants us to have. And then he's, he gives this charge, this brief charge to a guy named Archippus. See that you fulfill the ministry that you received in the Lord. We don't know exactly what that means, but I kind of feel like I'm glad I'm not Archippus because it seems a little, little daunting. Then he says this, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains and grace be with you. Uh, for those Bible scholars out there, it's likely that Paul had a, a scribe who wrote these things and he dictated them to him. He dictated the writings to uh, the scribe. But here he takes his own, uh, his own quill in hand and he signs it and he says, this is, this is my signature. This authenticates this letter. This means that I am writing it. And he says, I write this with my own hands. Remember my chains. Don't forget me. Don't forget my ministry. Don't forget to pray for me. And then he says, grace be to you. So what are we to observe as Paul closes out this letter to us? What are we to take away? Uh, I've got three things. The first is that the Christian life is not a solitary pursuit. The second is that following Christ means pursuing God-oriented relationships. And the third is that the Christian life is a life of grace. So the first one, the Christian life is not a solitary pursuit. Paul is one of those guys where you read the Bible, you read the New Testament, and you kind of get the sense that he's, if, if anyone were to be called a maverick, it'd be Paul. There, there are so many, if, I would encourage you to read through the book of Acts, there are so many places where the believers literally have to kick him out of town because the, the, the opposition, they want to kill him. And he's like, that's fine, kill me, I'm going to preach the gospel. And, then, and they're like, just too quiet, no, you know. And they're carrying him off. He's like, I want to preach the gospel. He, he lives his life. And, and if, if you read Galatians and, and some of his other uh, articulations of his ministry, he's very like, I received the gospel from Jesus when he met me. And, and I preached the gospel and I was not beholden to anyone. This is not a gospel I received from someone else. This is Jesus' gospel. He's very specific to say, this is my gospel that I received. I didn't make this up. You know, this, this is not something that I conjured up or that someone handed over to me. This is, this is the gospel that I received from God. So in many ways, he, he could have been a guy who lived his life in a solitary manner. I mean, he, he was, a, he was a, an apostle. He had the power of God. He was strong. He knew where he was going. Again, if you read through Acts, you see that, that the believers have prayed and they've heard the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit saying, you're going to die. You're going to get martyred. And he's like, I know. Let's do this. There's just a sense that he's ready to go where others are not willing to go. And yet, we see that he is accompanied almost constantly by others. First, it's Barnabas, the son of encouragement, who comes and brings him under his wing and, and, and brings him into fellowship with other believers. Then it's Silas. There's, there's one point, I believe, in, um, in Acts where he goes uh, to Athens and, and he ministers there and he's alone for a period of time. And it's interesting that there's not much fruit in that part of his ministry. These other places where he establishes churches, he is with people. And here we see that he is with people. In 2 Timothy, as he is in jail and he's looking forward to his death, he's doing what? He's begging and asking for Timothy to come to him because his life is not one that he wants to live in a solitary way. This just echoes what Jesus says in, in John 13. He says this, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. How, how are they going to know that, that we're disciples of Jesus Christ? It's not because we have Grace Covenant Church on the front of this, of this building. 
It's not because we have cool shirts that, you know, I'm an usher or, you know, I'm part of Lyft. Or, or, it's, it's not because we, we have good theology. And, you know, I can tell you, you know, the, the various different end time perspectives and, you know, why this is the right one and that's the right one. And uh, I'm a Calvinist. I'm an Arminian. This is not what, what Jesus says evidences our discipleship. He says your love for one another evidences our discipleship because you can know things and still be a convinced sinner. But you can't love people who are unlovable <laughs> without the grace and power of God in your life. The Christian life is not a solitary pursuit. Not only that, he says following Christ means pursuing God-oriented relationships. Paul's list of compatriots includes fellow ministers, Jews, Gentiles, a runaway slave, a former deserter, a doctor, and a soon-to-be deserter. His, his, uh, the Philippian church plant included um, a wealthy woman, uh, a, a demonized child, and um, I think a soldier. I mean, people from various different backgrounds. And here we see that, that Paul is drawing upon a group of people that you wouldn't necessarily see them golfing together. You, would, you wouldn't go to, you know, lands down as you're driving to go get Thai food. <laughs> you wouldn't do that and look over and see, oh, it's Archippus. The Asian, and, and it's, uh, it, it's Tich- no, Tichkas is the Asian, Archibus is, is a Thessalonian, and, uh, and there's Demas, oh, that, he looks grumpy, because he's going to desert, and there's a runaway slave, by the grace of God, there's no runaway slaves that lands down, but this is a group of people that you wouldn't put together. It, it evidences something of the, pu- the peculiarity of, of God. That he, he draws people together who otherwise wouldn't be together. And I love you guys. But I don't know that we would all hang out if it weren't for the work of God in the life of this church. And I, and I thank God for that. I mean, you can go to churches where what brings that, that group of people together, it, it has more to do with human characteristics than it does with the power and the mercy and the reconciliation of God. These were different people from different backgrounds with different lives, but they were drawn together by a common desire to follow Christ and love his people. Paul embraced ethnic, cultural differences, strained relationships, reconciliation with people he thought to be unhelpful, and the danger of future heartbreak, all because God was at work. And he did nothing different than what Jesus himself did. You know, the Bible says that Jesus prayed before he, he called his disciples. He prayed, and he, don't fool yourself, he knew he, who he was calling. He knew who Peter would end up being. He knew who G- Judas would end up being. He was not surprised by these things. And so at the beginning of three years, he, he chooses to build a relationship with individuals who are going to fail him, they're going to betray him, they're going to leave him. They're going to stab him in the back. They're going to say, this relationship, Jesus, is worth 30 pieces of silver. Paul had embraced a God-oriented, Christ-like view of relationships. Um, if you've been paying attention, Christian life, the Christian life is not a life of convenience and ease. Um, at times, it's a, it's a life of pain and sorrow. If, if your life is, I'm not asking for you to, to pursue pain. That, that's, that's not what we're saying. But if your life is just one of one cakewalk into another, and there's no challenge or difficulty or change or, or friction where your flesh meets God's holiness, then you're not walking a Christian life. Because it's the will of God that we be sanctified. And sanctification is, it's a challenge. It's not a life of convenience or ease, but it is the only way. In John 14, Jesus says this, I am the way, 
the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he's not just speaking there of faith in Jesus. That certainly is part of it. But when we say that we want to follow Jesus, Jesus in another place says, if you want to follow me, you need to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Paul, I've, I've, I've repeated this, but this has been on repeat in my mind. I want, I want us to hear this as a people. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, Paul says this. I'll start in verse 16. So our, our, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, though we're living lives and getting older and getting wrinkles and, and you know, having pains where we didn't know we had pains and, and didn't know there were muscles to be in pain and, and, and we have relational strain and difficulty and challenges and, and money issues, while our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. The things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Isn't that what Paul's been telling us? Set your mind on things above, not things below. Jesus is the only way. And that means in the context of our relationships with one another. He calls us to God-oriented relationships, not just relationships that meet, that, that are convenient and me-focused. Now that doesn't, I mean, we've all got coworkers and we have conversations around the water cooler and, you know, that's fine. But, but part of pursuing a Christian life is not just reducing your holiness to praying more, reading your Bible, sitting in church service, but it's to look around and say, how can I love and serve the people around me? How can I forgive the people around me? How can, how can I be a blessing to the people around me? The Christian life is... is it means following and pursuing God-oriented relationships. And then finally, it means that uh, life is a life of grace. Paul begins his letter praying for God's grace to be supplied. He says this, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father. And here he ends the letter reminding them that, that it all begins and it ends with grace. Your life, your forgiveness of sin, freedom from sin, forward progress in holiness, future hope, these things are all by grace. There's no point in, in, in your life where you can say decisively the progress was due to me. Now, now, the holiness that God expects of us requires our effort. But it's this effort that is, that is empowered by and, and carried along by the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit through the grace of God. And so even as we're seeking to obey God, we, know we, we believed in Jesus and he, he saved us at, at the point at which we put our faith in him all the way till we die. This period of time where we are, we are working out our faith with fear and trembling we have to understand that it is God who is at work. It's about grace. The unmerited favor of God which produces power for obedience and change. Right? That's, that's grace. The unmerited, of, unmerited favor of God which produces power for obedience and change is the instrument of God's shaping and forming in you. And, I, I, you know, if you weren't here for our prayer service, I... I I feel bad for you. <laughs> no. um, but one of the things we, we talked about as it related to prayer, uh, it came out of Hebrews chapter 4. And it says, says this in Hebrews chapter 4, verse, 17, uh, verse 16. There is no 17. There still is no 17. I said 17 the other time. Um, 
It says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace and help, grace to help in time of need. The good news is that the grace that you and I need is available. This is not grace that, that's locked in, in a closet that you have to do something to get from God. This is grace where, where you, go to, you go to the throne of grace and you say, God, because of the work of Jesus Christ, I am stepping up to the throne of grace, trusting that I will not die, that God will not smite me in this moment, but that you will receive me as a son, that you will receive me as a daughter, and that you will extend grace to me. That you will extend the power to obey, the power to change to me. It's the instrument of God's shaping and forming, and it's available to us freely. It doesn't mean that it makes it easy, but it is available. We are saved by grace. So he says the Christian life, or the three observations are that the Christian life is not a solitary pursuit. This is, this is why we are together. This is why, this is why there, for anyone who's honest, there's this kind of whiplash when you get married. And you realize, oh, I'm a jerk. I thought it was awesome. She thought it was awesome. We had both convinced ourselves that I was awesome. And now we're both very clearly aware that I am not awesome. Because there's something about being in real relationship with other people that reveals the brokenness in us, that reveals the sin in us, in us the sin in us. And, and we want to avoid that, right? We, we don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want to be, we want to, to protect ourselves. One commentary talked about it and and I'm just going to read it. I wasn't sure if I was going to. I'm going to. For those of us who claim the name of Christ, there are two distinct courses of life available. One is to cultivate a small heart. It is by far the safest way to go because it minimizes the sorrow of life. If our ambition is to avoid the troubles of life, the formula is simple. Minimize entangling relationships. Do not give yourself to people. Carefully avoid elevated and noble ideals. If we will do this, we will escape a host of afflictions. Many people, even some who profess to be Christians, get through life with minimum tribulation by having small hearts. The other path is to cultivate a ministering heart like that of the Apostle Paul. Open yourselves to others that you will become, and you will become more susceptible to an index of sorrows scarcely imaginable to a shriveled heart. Enlarge your heart and you will enlarge your potential for pain. Like he's being honest, right? Enlarge your heart. And, and, and you're welcoming pain into your life. The effects of these two kinds of hearts upon those around them are drastically different. Little hearts, though safe and protected, never contribute anything. No one benefits from their restricted sympathies and vision. On the other hand, large hearts, though vulnerable, also know the most joy and leave the greatest imprint on other hearts. Cultivate deafness and we will never hear discord. But neither will we hear the glorious strains of a great symphony. Cultivate blindness and we will be spared the ugly, but we will never see the beauty of a sunset or a bird on a wing. Cultivate a small heart and life will be smooth sailing, but we will never know the heady wind of the Holy Spirit in our sails and the power and uh, exhilaration of being borne along by the Spirit in accomplishing eternal things for God. Cultivate a small heart and we will certainly never have as great a heart as Paul's. Th this life that, that Paul calls us to is a life of a big heart where our, our vertical righteousness expresses itself horizontally in relationship. It's all about Jesus. Paul talks about the preeminence of Jesus in chapter 1. I would, I would encourage you to go back. Read chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. Read it again, then read it again, then read it again. And in, in chapter 3, we saw this hinge around which all of the, the, the rest of it kind of turned. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated in the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For if you have died, your life is hidden with Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him. It, it's about Jesus. Your life is about 
Jesus. Your love and your commitment to others is about Jesus. It's not about your convenience. It's not about my convenience. It's not even about your avoidance of pain and my avoidance of pain. He calls us into pain. He calls us into affliction. He calls us into suffering for the sake of others. Paul challenges us to focus on Jesus with our eyes set on his principles, his purposes, and his plans. I want you to listen to the words of, of this famous hymn by a woman named Helen Lemel. Uh, you, you may have grown up singing this. O oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see? There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Through death into life everlasting he passed, and we follow him there. Over us sin no more hath dominion, for more than conquerors are we are. His word shall not fail you. He promised, believe him, and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. And this is the chorus. Chorus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full into his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Paul has been calling us to turn your eyes upon Jesus. In your relationships, turn your eyes upon Jesus. In your family, turn your eyes upon upon Jesus. At work, turn your eyes upon Jesus. In your suffering and pain, turn your eyes upon Jesus and just watch how the world becomes a momentary and light affliction. In the weight, in the weight of the glory that we are looking forward to. Paul was so thankful for the hope that they had they'd been looking forward to. He was so thankful that the Colossians, under, they had faith that was being expressed in love for one another because of the hope laid up for them in heaven. And family, if you have faith in Jesus Christ that's expressing itself in love towards one another, you can be confident that there's hope laid up for you in heaven. And though you may not see it now, you will one day look into his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow dim God's going to recreate everything. He's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And you know what the sun is going to be? It's not going to be a star. It's going to be the presence of God. And that's not hyperbole. That's not, that's not metaphor. That's a reality that we can expect. That the glory and awesomeness of God is going to illuminate all of existence. Paul, has, he's, he's opened a crack into eternity for us to begin to look and see. And I would invite you to turn your eyes upon Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, we live in a world that invites us to look and, and be discouraged be hurt, be angry. Lord, we, we see wickedness in ourselves. We see wickedness in the world. We see the wickedness of our enemy. And at times, these, these forces can seem so big. But God, I pray that you would give us the vision of Paul, that we'd be able to look around and recognize that, that it is you who is at work, that as we set our mind on things above, Lord, that, that the things of the earth will would grow strangely dim. Lord, set our circumstances in perspective. Give us a greater vision of who you are. Help us to love one another, not because it's convenient or easy, but because it, it's God-honoring and God-oriented. Help us to be quick to forgive. Help us to be quick to, to love. Help us to keep short accounts. Help us to be life-giving, self-sacrificing, others-focused.
And God, I pray that you would draw near to us as we draw near to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you, family.